Yes, uh, good afternoon. My name's Ian Mayer. Um, I'm a former uh, Eveloo Locomotive uh, uh, Railway Workshop employee. I was first employed here on the 23rd of the third month 1976 as a shop boy in the millwright section. The shop boy's job was like a junior labourer and he, his job was to go around to, to get the morning tea orders, the lunch orders, uh, uh, to clean the uh, washing up buckets, to go and get the newspapers and um, uh, just general duties, office duties, uh, running errands for the boss uh, and things like that. I then progressed to the position of, of uh, junior labourer, then uh, I was a brickies labourer, then I was a fitter's assistant, all in the millwright section, and then I became the youngest acting overhead crane driver in the Everly Locomotive Workshops. I also drove the cranes in the foundry and I also drove the cranes in the large erecting shop, lifting the locomotives uh, off, their, off their bogies and putting them onto stands. Sadly, I wasn't there for the steam era. Um, and the, the skills that I, um, I acquired, not only here, but also at Trelora Bus Workshops, uh, I employed those skills uh, when I was working for the, for the private bus industry. And also, I still employ those skills when I, was, um, when I work as a volunteer for the Sydney, Sydney Bus and Truck Museum. I'm basically what you call uh, an understudy of a tradesman. Can you tell me, when we were talking on the phone, you told me something about a boxing ring. What yes, yes, the boxing ring. Um, I've got to be careful here. Is it all right if I name someone? Yeah, if you'd like to. Okay, okay. Um, my my, my subformer's name was Jimmy Jeffries. And Jimmy was a wonderful, wonderful man, but he didn't take kindly to fools. I'm being careful what I'm saying here. Um, and Jimmy was also an amateur boxer and he was damn good at what he did. And uh, anyway, for any of the shop boys or any of the apprentices that got too cheeky, he'd say, well, come on, son, we'll put a set of gloves and we'll go up the large directing shop and we'll sort this out. And I'll tell you what, when Jimmy had been through them, um, they didn't give any more cheek. Mm. Yes. And, and did management ever um, interfere, interfere with those sorts of processes and no. the way people dealt with it? No, it? no, it was a done thing in those days. You know, it was a pretty strict, it was a pretty strict regime. You know, like you had to have your, um, you know, you lift your docket at a certain time, you put your docket back on at a certain time. Um, if you got caught um, being away from your work location, uh, you could get a bung. Uh, as was already discussed, um, if you got a bung, you could lose 15 minutes of pay. If it was really bad, you could be even sent home and you'd lose whatever time. So like you got done, you could lose anything up to half a day's pay. Uh, in fact, it was so strict at one stage, uh, especially when I first started here, you used to have to, you used to, have to ask the foreman if, you, if they could give you permission to go and use the toilet. Yes. And the... The washing up buckets, um, I used to wash uh, 20, uh, 20 buckets by three, which is 60 buckets per day for our trades and non-trade staff because washing facilities and showering facilities um, were pretty limited here and um, the management believed in getting the uh, maximum production out of, out of the, the staff. I, I read some things in the oral histories about people hiding their buckets behind a machine so they could start to wash up ten minutes early. Correct. But if, but if you got caught... Oh, you were gone. You, yeah, if the boss, if the form, foreman or the works manager, um, the works manager caught you being off your job or, or washing up early, um, you'd be bunged. Um, you'd have a real please explain. Yeah. Hmm. Wow, that's incredible. So, um... Okay, so we've spoken about being a shop boy, we've spoken about the boxing ring. Was there, was there something else that I, that I said, oh, we, we said that we were going to talk about that today? Uh, the ovary crimes? Yeah, tell, tell, tell right. me about that. Um, when I just turned 18, which was 1978, um, there was a position that came vacant uh, for a crane driver. And um, I thought, yeah, beauty, this, this might 
give me some kind of qualification in life and anyway I became the youngest acting overhead crane driver. I drove all the overhead cranes in the main workshops, the large erecting shop and also the foundry. Uh, my my favourite crane, which sadly no longer is here anymore, uh, was L33 down, down at the uh, foundry. And um, I used to be on the metal pole there and what what used to happen there was um, all the core boxes would be from um, made up um, thanks to the thanks to the pattern shop supplying the patterns. Everything that was made in Everly for anything to do with the railways, all um, all had an Everly pattern behind them, and anything that was cast here at Everly always had the part number that started with E, which stood for Everly, and. At two o'clock in the afternoons at the foundry, I would be called upon, and L33 would be called upon, to lift the big ladle um, up to the furnace, and then the big furnace lid would open, then the big molten cast iron would be poured, a bit like just liquid, like boiling hot tea. Yeah, just all melted down, and it would go into a ladle, then what I'd have to do is then lift the ladle up, Cross travel, long travel, head north down the um, down the foundry to where the moulders were, and we then pour this big ladle into into a series of little ladles, being very very careful not to vary the temperature of the molten cast iron, otherwise it'd flash up everywhere, it'd spark, and people would get burnt and everything. Um, like has already been said today, the the working environment here at Everly. In those days it was very hot in the summer, it was very hot in the summer. Uh, in the winter time it was freezing cold. Um, the, we didn't have such luxuries as air conditioning or fans or anything like that. Um, we had a number of wooden fires in the place to try and keep the place warm. Later in the piece we had diesel fired um, uh, like stoves to try and keep the place warm. That was where we made the little racks to go on the, to on the side of the, the uh, chimneys of them. We used to cook our toast on it. Uh, yeah. and, um, uh, and of course, there, to get these diesel fired uh, stove things going, until the diesel actually caught a light, the workshop would be covered in smoke, in diesel smoke, yes, yes. But yeah, down, down the foundry, poor old L33, which is no longer with us. Um, um, we used to be on the metal pour, and on the afternoon shift uh, at the Everly foundry, there'd be 500 cast, cast iron brake shoes cast. And what had happened is it go through the um, hunter machine, go through what they call a shake out, which is shake the, the um, sand and the plumbago moulding back in, into, the, into, the, into one hopper and the red hot uh, cast uh, brake shoes would be all rattled along into a skip and there'd be 500 brake shoes made in the afternoon. Then what would happen is, is whatever we've cast during that day would be allowed to cool and we had a dressing shop and the, the parts would go to the dressing shop and there'd be a, dress, a, a, a dresser there which was like had a big uh, grinding wheel and he would dress the dags off the, off the, the castings. Yeah. And then of course whatever you'd, you'd been, that had been dressed, if it required machining, it would go to 10 bay to, to the machine shop. We used to have our own Oliver shop here, our own coppersmiths, um, we used to have a, a wheel section where we used to be able to sweat. Would you believe trains do have train wheels do have tyres? We used to sweat the we used to sweat the the the, the tyres off the rim off off the wheel, and then of course we used to heat the the new the new band up, and then we'd shrink the um, the train wheel the train tyre back on onto the train wheel. Well, you have given us uh, a description of process today that we haven't had from anyone else. Mm. So I'm just so grateful to you for that. Thank you so much. It's, a, it's been interesting to talk to the different guys in terms of the way you've each given a piece 
of Everly that I think is going to be beautiful cut together, isn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Because we've got lots of different, um, you know, like um, I think it was uh, Bill Driver was saying oh, this yes. is an industrial city within the city. It and certainly he was. Gave a fabulous thing about that. So thank you so much, Ian. In for fact, in. in the in the 1940s. Alexandria, like this is the area of Alexandria, Alexandria was known as the Birmingham of Australia. Like Birmingham in, in London in the 1940s was huge industrial. Well, this is what Alexandria was. And sadly, um, I think I've already made mention of the Boundary Hotel. Now, I'd like to do this because the Boundary Hotel, I'm an alcoholic. I've been an alcoholic since I was 15 years of age. But the Boundary Hotel, I used to drink in there with men, and I do say men, um, that were a lot older than me, that were old enough to be my own father. In fact, I had my 18th birthday party in, in the Boundary Hotel. And the lovely, late and great Jimmy and Jean McLaren, who, who was the publicans at the time, she said to me, Ian, or Lucky, as they sometimes call me, because that was my nickname in the Millwright section, um, you are 18 today. I said, yes, Jean. She said, well, prove it. So I pulled out my driver's licence. And they said, oh, yeah, OK, son, because we all used to drink out in the hen's pen, which was the, the ladies' parlour. And I can remember seeing elderly women up there, sitting there, with a, a bag and they'd be having a beer and a cigarette, peeling the potatoes, peeling the carrots, getting, getting ready to cook this evening's dinner. And uh, sadly, only about two weeks ago, the Boundary Hotel closed its doors. And was the Boundary where most of the Everly workers went to drink? Yes, yes. The Boundary Hotel um, had many, many a railway send-off, um, as I already said earlier on today. I've seen the Boundary Hotel at lunchtime four deep with uniforms and overall men. I've seen men come in there after working in the foundry, after working in the blacksmiths, and drink ten schooners in half an hour. Mm. Well, yes. that was so great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ian. And it, and in my short period of living and working around here for only 34 years, <laughs> I have witnessed, and I can name the pubs, 14 hotels that have closed. Because sadly this area, this area, because they've taken the manufacturing away, they've taken the railway workshops away, they've taken the, I mean this by the way, this is successive governments, both Labor and Liberal, have done this. They have basically de-skilled the, the workforce. Um, they have turned this area into, you know, they're saying, oh, we're trying to gentrify it and we're trying to yuppie fight. No. They've killed this area because there's no more industry. The, the amount of industries that are out there suffering today because, sadly, Redfern, Waterloo, Alexandria is made up of three kinds of people. One, the people have got expensive mortgages they can't afford anything. Two, people that are paying very, very expensive rent, they've got no money, and poor people like myself, who live on a disability support pension, that live in Department of Housing high-rise accommodation, yeah. and they've got no money. This area, sadly, because of the, the raping and the pillaging that has gone on by successive governments, is cash-starved. People, people are living in poverty because of it. I wish that Everly could reopen again as a fully functional uh, workshops so we could start up apprentice apprenticeships, so we could give the young people today, the young people today that deserve a fair go, instead of throwing them on the dole and saying, ah, oh, you're a dole bludger, give them a job, give them a trade, give them an apprenticeship, give them some kind of skill because we were once the lucky country, we're no more because um, who, is, who is the man that, that once quoted it? Australia has become the arsehole of the world. I think it was the great, the great Paul Keating, wasn't it? <laughs> right? And uh, that's what we've become. That's what we've become. And um, I do work within the um, 
Redfern area with the Aboriginal people. I have a young Aboriginal friend who's something like 17 years younger than me. When he and I met 14 years ago, that young man couldn't read or write. I, with my limited education, I don't have any high school education or school certificate, I was able to get that young man, young Aboriginal man, reading and writing. I taught him uh, and I used what they call the old rote system, which is you read something, you memorise and then you get the student to read it back to you. I and I've got him reading and writing to the point now where that has given that young man the confidence to be able to go to the Eura TAFE.